So we are now recording. Hi, this is Charlie Huff, former major league pitcher and now a minor league instructor with the Los Angeles Dodgers. And you're on with Heart to Heart. There you go. Works for me. Thanks, Charlie. Um, oh man, it's good to see you. Charlie and I, well, I feel like I've known Charlie my whole life. I was just telling him before we started recording that I was born in 1964. He came up with the Dodgers, I believe in 69 or 70. So virtually my whole influential life as a baseball fan, those of you who have listened to this podcast before and know that I'm a huge baseball fan, predominantly Dodgers, um, predominantly, I'm a total Dodger fan. I bleed Dodger blue, as Tommy Lasorda has been known to say. So I would watch Charlie come in out of the bullpen all through the 70s. Uh, from, from the time I was six to 16, Charlie was a Dodger. So very influential times. I pitched all through Little League and did my best to try to throw a knuckleball. And I actually had the opportunity one day to actually have you teach me the knuckleball. And we'll get into that story here in a little bit. <clears throat> Officially didn't meet Charlie until 2005 or six. I was running a, an in, independent minor league baseball team in Fullerton, the Fullerton Flyers. And uh, Charlie was uh, kind enough to come out and be our pitching coach for a season. So we'll also get into that. As he mentioned, uh, former major leaguer, pitched 25 years in the big leagues, started with the Dodgers. Um, he was the first pitcher to throw a pitch for the expansion Florida Marlins, now the Miami Marlins. And of course, he went on to beat my Dodgers 6-3 to three that day. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. 216 wins, three World Series, an all-star game. Charlie, it's just so good to see you. Look, you look like you did when I saw you 15 years ago. <clears throat> that means I didn't look that good. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's right. No, I, <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. No, I see you got golf on there back there. So how, how's your golf game first and foremost? I know the last time I saw you, I think we were teeing it up. Very mediocre. This is, getting old is getting old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too many things ache a little bit, but uh, you know, I used to play okay and now I can't. Yeah. But I still enjoy it. I love are it. You, uh, yeah. Are you at that point where you're starting to think about shooting your age? Um, you know, I just missed, uh, let's see, it's like two years now, almost three years. Um, I shot 71 when I was 70. Nice. So oh. I'll be 73 pretty soon. There you go. <laughs> so I, got, I got a little work left. To well, do. I guess the upside to getting older is that you can bogey a couple more holes now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you got a shot. Perfect. Up. That's my dad's 93, and that's his goal to shoot the age. So. Wow. Yeah, wow. I'm 56. I can shoot my age for nine holes all day long. Yeah, <laughs> so, I'm working on it. <laughs> very good. So let's just go back. I, I know I'm going to interview you as I know a little bit about you, but a lot of the people listening and watching today may not. But um, so you were born in Hawaii. You lived there just for a couple of years, as you said, just as, a, as an infant and then moved around. Talk about your just kind of growing up as a baseball player. I'd love to hear stories I don't know about, you know, Obviously, you pitched 25 years in the big leagues, so you probably had a little bit more talent as a youth baseball player than most of us did because, you know, I never had a scout even sniff me as a high school baseball player. Um, talk about when you kind of came to that point where you thought, wow, this could be something I make a career doing. Well, that started, I mean, a long time ago, um, like about when you were born or before, actually, 60. In 63, I think I was ninth grade, I was uh, – pitching American Legion with the, basically I was following my older brother around and um, and I was really tall I was almost six foot then uh, and I'm six one now so I mean I was like the same size and I threw pretty good and I pitched American Legion then high school in 64 it was uh, 10th grade for me and uh, my brother signed with Boston uh, Boston Red Sox and he got released like the next year, but I was a baseball nut. I mean, like most kids that play baseball, uh, I wanted to play, for me, I wanted to play third base for the Red Sox mm. after Frank Malzone. I don't know how many people would remember the name I Frank the Malzone, name. but uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play third base for the Red Sox. And as it turned out, I couldn't hit field or throw. <laughs> well, other than that, you're the perfect third baseman, yeah. Minor problems. And 64 or 66, out of high school, I was drafted in the second year of the draft. It was only, yeah. only started in 65. 66, I was drafted by the Dodgers, who I didn't care at all for. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I grew up in New England. Yeah, I was a Red right. Sox fan. My grandparents lived 
three blocks from the polo ground. So I was a Giants fan in New York uh, and Yankee fan, which was another three blocks further over. Sure. Uh, so I had a background in baseball, but not Dodger baseball. And, uh, you know, one of the best things that ever happened in my life was to be drafted by the Dodgers. And first year I signed at 18, I go to Ogden, Utah, and my manager's a 2B Hall of Famer. I guess I, I was pretty good luck for him. Uh, yeah. Tommy Lasorda was my first professional manager. So that set me up for a lifetime. I didn't throw a knuckleball then, it, but it set me up for a lifetime of working hard at trying to be good because I wasn't that good. I mean, <laughs> there are guys, we think we all think we're good, but there are guys out there that are exceptional. You know what I mean? And it just seemed like the Dodgers at that time was loaded with them. Yeah. So I, I was very lucky. I had great coaching right away. Well, and they've been known the Dodgers since I've been alive for having a, a tremendous farm system. I and mean, they always have, you look at all these rookies of the year they've had over the years and certainly, you know, you mentioned a name that has to come up in this interview and it would have come up later if you didn't already bring it up. And that's Tommy Lasorda. Um, I met Tommy. Uh, well, you meet somebody once I met him, I think at the winter meetings in 99 or 2000. And I've got a whole story I'll get into off the air there. <laughs> it's not something I would record. Uh, it is Tommy Lasorda after all. Um, but then he was kind enough to come out probably because of you. Um, not probably definitely because you were a pitching coach in 2006, he was kind enough to come out and, talk to our players with the flyers and, and, you know, do the, the inspirational thing that Tommy does with not only our players, but our fans and, and me, but so you've known Tommy virtually your whole life. You met him when you're an 18 year old kid, probably right. getting drafted to the Dodgers and playing for him in Utah all the way to playing for him in the big leagues in the seventies. And I know from my experiences with you that you and your wife, Sharon and Tommy and Joe are still to this day, you probably had dinner recently. I mean, I know he just turned 93. I'd be, Surprised yeah. if you didn't chat with him a couple of days ago. Um, yeah. Just, you know, when I, later in this interview, I want to do a little bit of a word association and I'll give you, you know, there, there's some names out there that you're tied to, good and bad. Reggie Jackson comes to mind and we'll go there later. But um, when you think about Tommy, if you were to describe Tommy to someone who's never even heard about him, how would you describe him? Well, I, I probably start with uh, inspirational. Okay. Because, you know, Tommy was a minor league player, got uh, a brief stretch in the big leagues. I think he was 0-4 as a big league pitcher. Uh, and getting to the big league, I, I tell you what, anybody that gets a yeah. day in the big leagues is really, really good. Yeah. Even if you can't perform at the level that you wish you could. Sure. But if you get there, you're very, very good. So his, his whole life became... I'm going to be a big league, whatever, coach, manager, uh, general manager. I don't know what his aspirations were right then, but he was going to make baseball his entire life. And that, you know, that was going to be, so, so you, you really never work. Yeah. If you, you know, you never work. You're a 12 year old little leaguer. You know, I've been that 12 years old. Now that's 50 years or <laughs> no, 60 years, 60 plus. Oops. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, you get to be a kid forever. If you work in baseball, because this is not work. Yeah. You know, you can gripe, we can gripe a little bit, but uh, that's what Tommy was. He was an inspiration to say, you're not here just for fun this week or to see how good you are this week. This is a, a lifetime of work. And for me, it hit me at 18 years old. Uh, it hit me like, wow, this is the way to do this. This is the way to do it. Be relentless at getting better. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, I think he's known for that. <clears throat> I've had, a, oh, yeah. excuse me, had the opportunity to speak with a lot of former players of Tommy's. And as I mentioned to talk with them myself and he does inspire you with his words, but also just, he, he, he is a hard worker. He always, you know, he worked hard to get to where he was, even to get to the big leagues. And then certainly as a coach and I, I flood with memories of Tommy, you know, as a fan, when I think about him, because I've followed the Dodgers my whole life. Talk about, I know, I don't, I don't know how, I mean, you were drafted as a third baseman. You're known as a knuckleball throwing pitcher for 25 years in the big leagues as, as for those who are watching, you know, when we're on zoom, 
we can put whatever name we want. You know, I have Ed Hart on mine because that's my name, real creative. Well, Charlie threw knuckleballs for <clears throat> a living and his nickname on his screen is Nuck. So you were signed as a third baseman. Talk about that story of evolving from a third baseman to a knuckleball pitcher. And then I want to get back into going into the big leagues as a rookie playing for Tommy again. Yeah, as a kid, you know, like most little league kids, and I had an older brother who was very good. Um, so I followed him. He played first. I played third. <laughs> I would have played first if he wasn't there. Um, but I loved playing third base. Uh, it, it was the most fun I think I ever had playing baseball, was trying to play third. Um, was drafted as a pitcher, third baseman. And as I say, when I went to Tommy, he had to kind of figure out where I belonged in pro baseball. And he let me play third a little bit, and I was a pretty good fielder. And I could throw across the infield pretty good. Um, and I could hit a little bit, but I couldn't run a lick. I mean, I was the slowest guy in the world, and I was not a home run hitter. So it came down to where's my options. Uh, I was an eighth round pick, and the uh, second round pick was a third baseman with some power. So I wasn't going to play much. Sure. Um, and so my option was, what did Tommy? What do I do? He said, "You got to pitch, kid." And uh, Fortunately, he said that to me, you know, and I was a regular pitcher. I threw pretty good that year um, and struggled in the first year in pro ball. I think I was five and seven with, you know, like a four, eight or something like that. Ball jumps in Utah. but Yeah, I was going to say, you're up but, in the elevation. Yeah. Everybody you're playing is up there in the middle. Yeah, of everybody was that kind of high ERA. Yeah. But, I mean, I was not a star on that team, okay? Um but that's where I was. I mean, I was an infielder, pitcher, whatever. And through the right leadership, the Dodgers, you know, and Tommy in particular, um, kind of guided me towards pitching. So that set me up for a lifetime of trying to be a big league pitcher. And I was, I guess you'd say, borderline type as a prospect. Okay. I mean, I, you know, an eighth rounder, and it was the second year of the draft. Um, you know, an eighth rounder, you're not, you know, you're not Walker Bueller. <laughs> yeah, you're on the cusp, and yeah. there's guys who've been drafted a lot lower who are in the Hall of Fame today, of course. Yeah, too, so. yeah. I'm so I'm basically just another guy with a dream of playing in the baseball, playing in the big leagues, and that's where I came from. You know, I mean, it was not a super talented thing. I just was lucky to be drafted by the Dodgers. If I was drafted by anybody else, the things that happened in my career couldn't possibly have happened. The people that I played for in the minor leagues, I played for what they play, like seven parts of seven years in the minor leagues. And all but one of my managers managed later in the big leagues, wow. Tommy Hall of Fame manager, yeah. but all of the other ones with the exception of one, and he was a Hall of Fame player, Duke Snyder. Oh, yeah. so, so all of the people I played for, um, Del Crandall from Fullerton. Yeah, Fullerton guy. Right? Exactly. Fullerton yeah. man. I grew up with his, his uh, grandson. Another inspiration, you know, these people put, put us, put a guy like me in the mode to have a chance to play in the big leagues because I was under talented. <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, yeah. and I pitched what four years as a regular pitcher, it's fastball, curveball, slider, change up, lousy change up, <laughs> lousy fastball, average fastball at best, they said, and I ended up with a sore shoulder. And uh, Tommy, I mean, to, to finish where, where, how I ended up being a knuckleballer. Yeah. Tommy uh, got me invited to uh, the Instructional League in 69. And uh, it was my second trip to the Instructional League and a minor league instructor. This is one of the things I love about minor league instructors, a guy named Goldie Holt. Okay. Watching me play catch, walked up to me and said, hey, uh, have you ever tried to throw a knuckleball? He knew my shoulder was bad. Yeah. And uh, I said, no, show me how. You know, and he showed me a grip on the ball. And in five minutes, I threw one that didn't spin. 
Wow. I don't, you know, the ball, the grip he showed me, yeah. I've never changed it. I moved the ball a little bit, but I never changed it, the grip itself. And for the next 25 years, I held the ball exactly the same and it just fit. So I had, you know, the fortune of if Goldie Hall doesn't walk up to me, I don't know what I do. Yeah. If you were playing you know, for anybody else, you wouldn't have met him. And yeah, it's, I'd be, I'd be punching tickets, working at the racetrack at high <laughs> level. You know, I mean, that would, that's where I would have gone. Yeah. Um, so I got really lucky to, to be drafted by the Dodgers, run into Tommy, gave me a chance. I mean, it was, everything happened right. Yeah. So you lead me into a couple of topics that I think my audience, a lot of my audience, are not sports fans and this, and the podcast wasn't created to be sports related. Although I would talk to sports personalities all day, every day, because that's where my passion lies along with family business, of course. So let's talk about, you know, Duke Snyder, Tommy Lasorda, these other managers who are influential, Goldie Holt, who obviously played a key role in, in you becoming yeah. a 25 year, not a key role, probably, you know, one of the top two or three key roles in you becoming a 25 year uh, major leaguer. What have you learned about leadership? Because you've coached, you were a coach with us for a year, and I know you continue to coach, and you talked about being an instructional coach now for the Dodgers and how you had to come home early from spring training this year because of the pandemic, and you know we might touch on that in a little while as well. But how have you taken what you learned as a young man growing up in the game and tried to apply that now as a leader and a coach? I mean, I know you're not the manager, but you still – you. you people you've talked about, your coaches were probably just as influential on you as anyone. How have you yeah. tried to adapt what you learned from them as a leader yourself? It, it's a different personality. I mean, uh, you know, I never had a personality like Tommy. Well, I who does? Yeah. Who does? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that is a, you know, he's a general. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd be a corporal, sergeant type of thing. Yeah. But all of those guys taught me things. Um, like I said, Del Crandall, uh, Norm Sherry, yeah. uh, Roger Craig. These guys taught me things about baseball and about teaching and coaching and getting on the level with the player. You don't have to teach the stars. Yeah. You guide them along a little bit, make sure that they're doing their things right. But the guy like me, which is most players, um, you need to reach them on their level. You need to get where they trust what you say. And that is a, a little bit of a trick, you know, but I learned a lot of that stuff through those guys. I was not a Lasorda style coach. Right. Tommy didn't coach how to throw the ball. Tommy coached beat the other team. Hmm. Figure out how you to. Know, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> he gave you that inspiration that, there's nothing, nobody just tries. I need players that do it, that win. And other guys like uh, Tell and Norm were very calm and never let you practice poorly. You do something poor in practice, stop. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it till we get it right. Tommy was, let's kill these guys. Yeah. Different styles. And I'm more on that style coaching which I love working with a pitcher, uh, working with a team. Uh, it is to me what, what, what happened to me, you know, I, the help that I got and that's where you want to be. I mean, that's what, that's what I love to do. I still love it. Yeah. Yeah. I heard my, my golf coach growing up, um, you and I played a little golf. I, you know, I, I can't hold a candle to you on the golf course still to this day, but, my golf coach always taught me don't adhere to the phrase practice makes perfect adhere to perfect practice makes perfect. We yeah. play the way we practice. So it sounds like Tommy's like, Hey, at the end of the day, I want the number next to LAD LA Dodgers to be higher than the other guy and how we get there, we get there. But yeah. there were, sounds like there were others that taught you, look, we are going to play the way we practice. And if, if you goof off in practice, you're going to goof off in games and, and we're not going to win. Were there any players that were that stand out as I know you came up just after Kofax. I'm sure you, you know Sandy because you've been in the organization forever. You saw him pitch because you were an influential teenager loving the game, just like I was as a teenager during the hey, I mean, not you were watching Kofax pitch when you were a teenager. So 
you've seen and pitched it for or against Oral Hershiser. You've seen Kershaw today. I'm naming some of the Hall of Famers or the, or the guys that should be or could be Hall of Famers. But if not one of them, who stood out to you as kind of that guy? If you were building a, a, a rotation around a pitcher that you either played with, coached, or have watched since, who might that be and why? There were, there were guys as that I came, when I came up, kind of the star pitchers on the team were Don Sutton, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Claude Osteen. Yeah. Uh, Claude spent as much time talking to me about pitching as anybody. And here's a guy that was a great pitcher with very limited stuff. Another yeah. guy was Jim Brewer, mm -hmm. the relief pitcher, left-handed pitcher with That's a screwball. Cool. Yeah. Country guy. Um, I was lucky, like I say, Dodger guys. I was around those guys, and they taught you things. I mean, taught me how to get ready in the bullpen. Brewer did. I never relieved before. And uh, the first year I throw a knuckleball, I end up in the big leagues. I was up in less than a year from my first ever knuckleball. And here I, I have no idea what I'm doing, how to warm up, how to throw it. All I could do was take it and throw it as hard as I could forward. <laughs> and so I had great guys. I had a fabulous pitching coach uh, in L.A., Red Adams. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible with names. Red was... Uh, uh, pulling well, names, all these guys who oh I... Oh, my God. Yeah. The, the, the work he put in with me, uh, and my delivery and stuff, I mean, it was just crazy. That, like I say, and Tommy was always the inspiration for me to get better. It was it was that simple. He brought me to AAA. Tommy was the AAA manager the year I started throwing the knuckleball. And he brought me there. And one of the first things he said to me, because I was pretty wild, you know, I never really fixed that either. Uh, um, he said to me, he said, you're going to throw a knuckleball till it's 3-0. So the, none of this trying to sneak a fastball by somebody. You're going to throw a knuckleball till it's 3-0. and And if you believe you can get a knuckleball over 3-0, and you throw it. Again. So that was my inspiration. To, I got a guy that loves what I can do. Yeah. It doesn't always work, but there's stretches where it's really good. And he loved the good stretches. So he gave me that that feeling of, okay, you're going to win. You're going to beat the other team because you've got a pitch they can't hit. Mm -hmm. When I got to the big leagues, and, and not to knock a guy, I mean, uh, Waller Alston, great manager, Hall of Fame manager, sure. but his first rule for me was 2-0, and oh, I had to throw a fastball. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't want me, he didn't want me to walk. I, I didn't right. want to walk him either, but but I would, you know, the first three hits I gave up in the big leagues were in Chicago. I got a save that day, too. But the first three hits I gave up were Billy Williams, Johnny Callison, and Randy Hundley. Two old fastballs and all three home runs. Ooh, so they knew. Yeah, I was one of yeah. those Chicago so they got the days. And I pitched well. I pitched five innings for a save. But it, it, it set in my mind. I've been in the big leagues two days at that time. And it said in my mind, 2-0, and oh, I'm in trouble because I've got to throw a pitch that wasn't working in the Texas League <laughs> to the big league stars. And it, it, it took me years to get over it. The 2-0, and oh, oh, don't get behind, don't get behind, don't walk this way. It's like looking down a fairway with water right, OB left. Well, and that's all you can see. You can't see the middle of the fairway. I right. couldn't see the strike zone. You're thinking, don't hit trying, it in the water. Don't hit it into the wood. I was trying not wall. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough because, you know, you know the psychology of sports better than anyone when you're thinking about what you don't want to do. You know, it's like that tree well, in the spent, middle of the fairway. Don't hit the tree. Yeah, right? yeah, the tree. yeah. Well, I spent uh, a lot of years uh, throwing a knuckleball as hard as I could. And, and trying to make the batter miss every pitch. Yeah. Um, and on a particular day, I had, a, I had to start a game in San Francisco. And on the trip with us was the greatest fastball pitcher of all time, which we believe anyway. I certainly do, Sandy Koufax. Sure. So who would think this guy is a great coach? 
right off the right off the top of your head, Sandy Koufax. He was a wild guy, and he the guy that helped him was one of my managers, Norm Sherry. And he told me sitting in the clubhouse before the game, I'm going to start against the San Francisco Giants. And he said to me, why don't you throw some of those real slow knuckleballs you throw messing around? Like a changeup. Yeah. And, and I, all I thought was, Sandy Koufax was telling me to just loop it up there. Yeah, I thought I was supposed and, to just throw it as hard as I can, right? I'm, exactly. And uh, I thought, well, okay, I'll try that. And during the game, I don't know how I, I got two quick outs in an inning and Jack Clark was up. Hmm. And I just said, well, let's see how far he can hit it. And I threw it as slow as I could. And he had a little weak dribbler to third base. And I thought, wow, Kopax just taught me a new pitch. There you go. And, and he didn't teach me the pitch. He knew I could do Nothing, it, yeah. but I didn't. Right. You know what I mean? Now, all of a sudden, I had another weapon. And, and like a year later, I was gone. <laughs> you know, I, I was sold to Texas. But it changed my career because now I could change speeds on the ball and because I trusted it. I could have done it all along, but I didn't trust it. I wasn't pitching enough innings to, to try things like that. And that's a so, great lesson in leadership. As a leader, if we can teach the people that we lead to believe in themselves, that they have the ability to do something. We, we see it before they do. And we have to yes. encourage them, hey, you can throw this. You don't have to throw it 80 miles an hour. You can throw it 68 miles an hour and it can be just as or more effective because now if you can not only deceive them with the knuckleball, but also deceive them with the speed of it, that's, that's another arrow in the quiver, as they say. It, it, it changed my career as a starter because now I didn't have to throw every pitch for the batter to miss. It. Swing and miss, swing and miss. Right. Now I'm throwing pitches where, okay, you're going to reach out and pop this slow one up. Yeah, and then I'll throw a hard one in a minute. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it 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 set me up for being a decent starter for the next yeah. thirteen years, that kind of thing. Did you prefer starting over relieving? I know you were a reliever primarily with the Dodgers and not a starter. Much easier. Yeah, because you Much knew when you were going to pitch for one, right? No, I, that never that never entered my mind. Okay. When when you're going to pitch routines and stuff, never ever entered my mind. I just I show up at the park. Uh, let me pitch. When I was sold to Texas in 80, yeah, I was there a month or so and wasn't, wasn't pitching much and wasn't pitching good. That's why I was sold. <laughs> and uh, if you remember Ferguson Jenkins, Hall of yeah. Famer, yeah. Texas Ranger, we were teammates. And Fergie uh, got in trouble with some substance and was arrested in Toronto. And he's Canadian. Hmm. Wow. He was arrested in Toronto. So we had a day game, first day into Toronto. And uh, I walked into clubhouse and there's a baseball, a new ball in my shoes, one of my baseball shoes. And that usually would mean you were pitching. Yeah. I pitched that day. I pitched a shutout. I hadn't started a game in like a year. And uh, I shut out the Blue Jays. And they weren't very good, but I shut them out. They're and still major leaguers, to your point. Yeah, yeah. They're a big league team. Yeah. And it, it kind of made me think, wow, this is what I should have been doing all along, 13 years, you know, at that point, or yeah. 12 years at that point. So, you know, things happen. <laughs> things happen. Well, you know, it's funny starting so much easier. There's that, there, I, and I'm sure you think about this, and, you know, guys like Daryl Evans, who I know well, and you know Daryl, you know, he hit 414 home runs, 86 more, he would have hit 500, and that's the magical number to get into the Hall of Fame. You had 216 wins in your first 10 years. You were pitching out of the bullpen. Yeah. I'm sure you've had the thought more than once cross your mind, and other people have probably put it there if you haven't, because I know you, and you probably don't think much about this. But, you know, 84 more wins, and you're at 300. If you'd have been a starter for those 10 years as a Dodger, you probably would have gotten those wins. And, you know, we'd be saying Hall of Famer uh, today, most likely. So, in my mind, you are already 20. You pitched 25 years in the bigs. You have the accolades, you have your Hall of Famer, and, and uh, you know, there's no doubt. Do, do you ever think about that at all? Uh, not really. You know, you know, things happened in my career. Like I said, I was, uh, when Sharon and I got married, uh, December 69. Wow. Okay, December 69, we got married, 
and I went to spring training, what, February, March? Sure. I go to spring training in minor leaguer. On a, I was on the AAA roster, but I had never been in AAA. And I told her I might be home in two weeks. Yeah. I might end up in Albuquerque, or I might end up in AAA in Spokane, Washington. And I said, we're in Miami, we're in Hialeah. And I said, okay, if I go, if I make a team, you're going to have to get there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how my career was. And we had no money. No, I was making 800 a month. Uh, and Tommy, like I say, Tommy kept me on the AAA team. So things happen. Sure. You know, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for having been a starter in 70, 70. You know, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade anything I did. It, it was just too much fun. Yeah, and that to me, that's that's how I hear your life story when I met you back in the, you know, 10, 15 years ago is, you know, you just see yourself as how blessed you are that you got to do what you did for a living and what you get to continue to do for a living. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was you know, I, played, I, I played those, excuse me, I played those first six years after start learning to throw an aqua ball at big leagues up and down for a few years and then there for the rest of the time. Uh, I played my next six winters. Sharon, Sharon and I both went in the Dominican Republic. So two weeks after the season, it would end. Uh, I'd head down to the Dominican, play ball until about two weeks to spring training. So, so you just you know, your round get into it. You get hooked on the game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's in your blood. I mean, I'm, I'm 56 years old. I haven't played a competitive baseball game since I was 18 years old. I yeah. was the GM of a team for three years, and that was certainly competitive. But yeah, it's in your blood. I mean, I, I, um, listening and watching the Dodgers has been something I've done my whole life and any, I'll, I'll watch any baseball game, but I'm really into it if it's the Dodgers, cause that's my team. So let me throw a few names at you. Um, we've talked about Tommy a little bit. I, I want to tell a quick Tommy story that involves you and me. Um, for those that, that know, I had the good fortune of working in professional baseball for three seasons. You know, Charlie's done it his whole life, and I'm very envious of anybody that's gotten to do that. Um, 2005, 6, and 7, I was a general manager of an independent minor league baseball team in Fullerton, my hometown. And we were looking for a pitching coach going into the 2006 season. And a, a mutual friend of Charlie's and mine, Steve Detola, who worked then and still does work at Cal State Fullerton, got wind that we were looking for a pitching coach. I guess you and Steve have known each other a variety of different ways, golf buddies and so forth. Anyway, long story short, I get introduced to Charlie, and uh, I felt like, a, I think I've told you the story, Charlie, I felt like a college football coach going into the living room of a, of a blue chip high school quarterback, trying to convince you to come play quarterback for my university. Um, Charlie had already decided, I think he was going to be our pitching coach, and probably had already announced that to, to Gary Templeton, our manager, but I got to feel like I was in there recruiting Charlie a little bit to come be our pitching coach, and um so after we, we signed Charlie to be our pitching coach, I get back to my office probably the same day or next day, and there's a voicemail on my on my machine at work from Tommy Lasorda. And Tommy has gotten wind now that we have signed Charlie Huff to be our pitching coach for the Fullerton Flyers. And I'll never forget just how my, my whole heart just dropped. I was so excited that we had Charlie. I'd met you now, and it's like, wow, you're going to be our pitching coach. My players were excited. Tempe, Gary Templeton was happy about it. And then I'm thinking, well, if Tommy wants you, you're going to obviously go back and be a pitching coach with the Dodgers. And um, I'll never forget when I talked to you and you told me that that wasn't something you had interest in doing. You didn't want to travel. And they weren't looking at bringing you in to be the pitching coach for the Los Angeles Dodgers that year. They wanted you. I think you'd probably take you back to Ogden where you started it all as, a, as an 18-year-old kid, ironically enough. But Tommy offered me 10,000 baseballs, which would have covered a lot of our budget for the opportunity to, to trade Charlie Huff to the Dodgers. But so there's that, you know, Charlie Huff, Tommy Lasorda, 10,000 baseballs story that uh, was pretty fun. You, um, I remember you had dinner, I think, that weekend with, with Tommy and Joe. And do you remember, I mean, you probably don't remember. You've had so many memories through the years of, of baseball. Do you remember much or anything stand out to you about that year that you were our pitching coach or that process of coming in to agree to be our coach for that season? Uh, the, the whole thing, you know, I, I hadn't done much for – you know, the last couple of years, I, I, I had been the New York Mets pitching coach in 2001 and two. Then I did a, a few months during the uh, 03 season uh, with the Padres at Lake Elsinore. Uh, 
filling in for them. They had fired somebody and needed somebody. But basically, I was not looking to work right then at that time. And uh, you, the Fullerton Club is three and a half miles from my house, you know. So that was a perfect deal for me. And it, it ended up, I went back the next year uh, to coach in San Bernardino with the Dodgers. So the thing about Fullerton, you know, one of the things that was really neat was Chris Jacobosca. Yeah, I was going to bring Chris's name up. Yeah. Um, you know, and we had some good, good, good young players and guys that have gone on to work in baseball and, and coaching college and high school. Uh, but Chris got a chance to play in the big leagues uh, out of uh, the Golden League. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of a thrill. You yeah. know, I mean, that story, and then he got hurt. He got hit with a line drive that, that kind of messed up his career. Yeah. He had a chance to stay for a little longer, but he did pitch in the big leagues. And that, yeah. I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know I've talked to Jack about that as well. And 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 I was going to ask you that. So you threw the knuckleball 25 years. You're a, That's your special. Jack, Chris didn't throw a knuckleball, to my knowledge. He may have dabbled with it in the bullpen because you were his coach. But um, how to, this, this brings up a bigger question for me that you know, I've got my opinions, but I want to hear yours. Um, how does a leader who has not done what he's, he or she is teaching his people to do teach them to still be effective. So Chris is, uh, you know, he threw a pretty good fastball. That's what got him to the big leagues. And he had a couple other pitches as well. Uh, one of which was not a knuckleball. So how does a knuckleball specialist teach a guy who doesn't throw a knuckleball to get him good enough to become a big leaguer? Wow. And I have to, that's a great thought because uh, pitching, throw, no matter what you throw, it's still the same basis. Throwing strikes, body, direction, uh, there's maybe some different strength conditioning things to throw hard, but uh, the art of pitching never changes. Okay. It's just different grips, different throws, different levels of when to do what, up and in, low and away, but it's all the same. A knuckleball is all of the pitches. Today you hear the term tunneling pitching. Sure. So here's a fastball, there's a curveball off of it. Uh, well, it's really just a knuckleball. I just don't know which which movement yep. it's going to get. And I try to explain that with kids. So we may, we need to make your curveball look like your fastball. Otherwise, you're just telling a guy, hey, this ball is going. This is coming. Yeah. Yes. It, uh, it's. Yeah. It's an art. Yeah, when you're 16 and you've got that 96 mile an hour fastball, you can tell the kid at the plate, I'm throwing a fastball, kid, and you're not going to hit yeah, it. Right. For sure. Doesn't work when you're at the big league level. Almost everybody that signs is the best player, I'll keep it at pitching, the best pitcher around. Yeah. He's the best pitcher on his little league team, junior high, whatever, high school college scholarship he's generally the best pitcher on that team and then he goes to the minor leagues and everybody is the best pitcher right you know and all the guys you're striking out at those levels and in the minor leagues and the low uh, low rookie leagues and stuff all of those guys you dominate are going home mm -hmm. the couple guys that gets hit get a hit off you those are the guys you have to get better than. You have to learn how to get better so you can compete with them. Because the other guys are going home. Yeah. And if you can't get that the the three and four hitters out on the other team in the minor leagues, someone else you're, will. You're going home too. Yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. try and teach that. So so no matter what you throw, what grips you use to throw the ball, yeah. it's still pitching. Was there a player, a name player that we all know of that when he came to the plate, and I don't mean you to try to embarrass anybody, obviously, because I'm going to flip the question here in a minute, the other way. But was there someone that we might be surprised that when they came up, you just knew, oh, I got this guy? Well, I mean, God, there's probably a lot of them, but anybody that we might be surprised. There, there is a guy that is uh, not a star baseball player, but a pretty darn good one. And most people wouldn't remember the name, Mark Salas. Okay. He was a backup catcher pretty much for, I think, Oakland. I know the White Sox, uh, Yankees, and Twins. Mark Salas, I 
probably hit 800 off me. He, he was the guy that... He just owned you, huh? Uh, yeah, he might not play for two or three days, and when I pitched, he played. He was in. That's fine. Uh, there, was, there was, if you can remember in the 86, maybe, the Twins, he was with the Twins. He okay. was their best. And they had a great team. I, I think they won the World Series that year. Mm -hmm. Whatever year they won yeah. the World Series. 87 they won it, but yeah. Okay, okay, 87. So I go in there in September into Minnesota. I'm starting the game, and I used to smoke back then. I'm sitting in a, on the trainer's table with a cigarette, and a radio's on three hours before the game, and the Twins have traded Mark Salas for Joe Necro. They needed another starting pitcher. And I told the trainer, the game's over. We can just phone this one in. I'm going to shut him out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was really strange. Somehow, the trade was not going to be official till midnight. And uh, Mark Salas stayed. He, he didn't play. They didn't play him. They didn't want him to get hurt. Yeah. And I had, a, I had the Twins beat two to one in the ninth. And leading off pinch hitting. Oh, no. Mark Salas, first pitch he hit over that baggy. The, the, <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Bag. Tied, tied it up. Uh, no win, no nothing. You know. Oh, man. And the, yeah, and the next day he goes to New York. <laughs> he, he was really tough on me. Yeah. It, it was not fun. See, you now, ladies and gentlemen, this is traditional or typical Charlie Huff right here. You all heard me ask him, who did you own? And he answered by telling us who owned him. That's the Charlie. Oh, no, I love, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. No, that's perfect. Let me, let me throw a couple names your way. And, uh, you know, everybody of my circle of friends who found out that I was going to be interviewing you, you know, because they don't have to sit here and ask the hard questions. They said, Oh, ask him about this. So I'm just, and you and I've talked about this before, you know, you've signed the baseball card I have here in my office too. Reggie Jackson, what comes to mind when you think of good old number 44 for the Yankees? Uh Superstar. Um, you know, I remember a couple of times people asked me questions. First of all, we hit three home runs. In the, yeah, and you were, you were the third of the three. I'm right? the third guy. Yeah. Um, so he hit, Fred, my he hit three home runs on three pitchers on three yeah. pitchers in the 78. I, I blame Bert Hooten for it. So. Okay. Well, <laughs> obviously two, it two, wasn't two, a 2-0 fastball because it was your first pitch to him. Yeah. So. The, uh, the thing that strikes me with Reggie, uh, absolute Hall of Famer, 500 plus homers, all that stuff. But every team, if you look at his career, and this is a special guy, um, and, and some places not very well liked. I had no reason to dislike him. In fact, he did something very nice for me one, one time. But uh, he, every team he played for got better, became a contender. I mean, he won what he was in five. Uh, world Championship. Mr. October, yeah. I played in three World Series. All three were against him. That's right. Oakland and New York twice, and we yeah. lost all three. Um, he not only was a great player, he, and he was not necessarily the best hitter, batting average-wise, mm -hmm. a lot of things, but he won ball games when he When he got out there, he was a team leader. Uh, not, I, got, I got nothing bad to say about Reggie sure. Jackson. I mean, I, yeah. the, the guy is a definite Hall of Famer, and to do what he did, and not just against me, but against a, a number of people, you know, he did hit 500 and something over. So, sure. yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, it never bothered me one minute. Yeah. What about Vin Scully? You know, Vinny just uh, retired a couple of years ago, 67 years calling Dodger games. You know Vinny well. Yeah. Talk about Vinny. Any, any stories that come up for you? You know what? How do you do a story or, or yeah. something about Vin Scully? The master storyteller himself. Yeah. Other than, you know, when I was a kid coming up with the Dodgers, you could hear we'd be sitting in the bullpen, even on the mound on some nights. Yeah. You could hear, you could hear Vinny because people carried transistor radios yeah, to the ballpark that. back then. They had radios with them, and you could hear him. So that's how important he was, you know, to the Dodgers. So yeah. what, what do you say about him? Thank you. I miss, those. 
Yeah, I yeah. missed those years of being in the ballpark and watching the game and hearing Vinny. It's almost felt like it was piped in, but it was probably just everybody's radios that were on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, uh, he was special. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was a good one, good man to this day, and uh, certainly someone that uh, a lot of us admire just because of the type of yeah. guy he is as yeah. well. Yeah. What about Gary Templeton? You and Gary worked together in 80 era. Yeah, we, we, we got to work together for a bit there. Uh, good man. What a player. <laughs> you know, probably an uh, underrated player. I mean, he's a guy that was traded for a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Smith. All right. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> was certainly a better hitter. <laughs> certainly yeah. a much better hitter. You know, I mean, he was a great player. Good yeah. guy. You know, um, I, and I don't even know if he's working right now. I don't know if he's working in. Public. Yeah, I think he's uh, being a full time grandpa. Last I talked to him, we, we stayed, yeah. you know, we worked together for three seasons with the yep. Flyers and we've stayed in touch over the years. I know, unfortunately, his wife passed fairly recently. And so he's been, you know, that's that's been hard, obviously, but yeah. very actively involved in, in his kids and grandkids lives and playing a lot of golf, probably like you are. And, and uh, I think we need to get out on the golf course sometime again. So we'd love to. Yeah. So when you play baseball, I, you know, I'm going to bring this back full circle to, to what I do for a living for a moment. Cause again, you know, I, I, I know a lot of the diehard baseball fans are listening, but I want those that, that run family business and work in leadership and so forth to, to, that might not be baseball fans to benefit from this conversation as much as anyone. Um, every year you go to spring training and you're basically getting a new family to a certain extent. I mean, you got the core guys every year in and year out. You knew that in the 70s, you knew when you pitched Garvey was going to be at first, Lopes, Russell, say, Dusty Baker. By the way, that's a trivia question for you. When I say April 24th, 1977, does anything come up for you? April 24th, 77. You're in <laughs> Atlanta, and you did something that day oh, that, that Ron oh, State, Lacey, Dusty Baker, and Steve Garvey also did. I think I hit a home run. You hit your only major league home run that yeah. day. Ninth yeah. inning, you have a 16 to six win. And yeah. uh, it, yeah. it was close when I came in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was the game winner, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So uh, yeah, dude. So your one big league home run. What what uh take me to that memory? Because every pitcher I've ever talked to remembers every home run they ever hit. Well, I, I you know what? I was a halfway decent hitter, you know, and in the minor leagues I hit some home runs. Um and basically, I tried to hit a home run every time I walked. There. Why not, right? <laughs> but at, at that time, the relief pitchers, you didn't bat very often. So, you know, I might get five at bats a year or 10 at bats in a year. Pretty tough to hit. So I just finally stumbled into one and hit a high fly to left in uh, Atlanta, which was what uh, what they call it, the launching pad. The launching pad, sure. So, so a few people hit a home runs in Atlanta. Well, I stumbled right. into them. But you share good company that day. I mean, you hit it, you know, Garvey, yeah. you say, yeah. Dusty Baker, Lee Lacey. These are guys that hit some some dingers for the Dodgers. Yeah. So, so back to my question, you, you know, you got your core guys that are going to be on the team every year, but you got new guys coming in. So really, and you know, when a season ends, it's like, okay, this is the last time this family is going to be together because guys will get traded, guys will get sold, yeah. guys will retire, uh, free agency, and so forth. Um, were there times you, you pitched in three World Series? You mentioned that uh, you were an All Star. Were there times coming into like the first few days of spring training or early in a year where you just looked around the clubhouse and thought, "Man, there's something really special here with this group." And and I'm guessing the answer to that question is, of course, there were times. What was it about the chemistry, if you will, that you sensed in a team and thought, "We got something special here as a as a family, as a team." Well, that, 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 that whole stretch of, I'd say, 74 on with the Dodgers, that whole stretch, every year felt like, you know, we came close in 73. Yeah. And that's when things happened, when Garvey finally got to first, say, get to third. Lopes played every day. Russell was there already in there. Um, and then we made a move for uh, Reggie Smith. I mean, and then later we made a move for Rick Monday and Baker. I mean, we just kept getting better and better. And every year felt like we should win it all. You know what I mean? And, and we didn't pull it off, but we were close right. pretty, much, pretty regularly <laughs> until we had some injuries and stuff. But um, every spring there felt like a, I was a kid. Uh, in Texas, we had a couple that I thought, Wow, we're going, when we got Nolan Ryan, 
89 or so. The, yeah. the clubhouse was different. The media was different. Uh, it was exciting. And we, and we didn't win, no, unfortunately. And then my, my last couple of years with uh, Florida Marlins. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically I'm pitching in the big leagues, first game down there, and it's 10 miles from where I went to high school. Yeah. You know, where I grew up. So uh, really every day, and I was with my brother back then, uh, you know, playing golf, having fun. And it was just fabulous to walk into that clubhouse and all those kids in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that, you talk so much about the love of the game and growing up as a kid and how we still feel like kids because we're around it. You're 45 years old. It's 1993. You're, you've been signed to pitch for this expansion team down in Florida, now the Miami, then the Florida Marlins. But not only are you signed, then you make the rotation, but then you're the starting pitcher opening day, which non-baseball fans, that basically means the manager thinks you're the best guy on the team. At least at that moment, you're either the healthiest and or the best. And uh, you're 45 years old and you're getting the ball on opening day, the very first opening day in Marlins history. Take me through that emotion. Well, it couldn't have been better when they when they uh, offered me the job to go down there. I said, for sure, it, it was no discussion. You're older than your coaches for the most yeah. part, probably. Yeah. No discussion about salaries or anything like yeah. that. Okay, let's what I made, what I did last year. Let's go. And yeah. they wanted me there to be a bit of a leader on that pitching staff. You know, so there's no complaining about what they asked me to do. I had to relieve whatever, whatever they wanted yeah. me to do. I'll carry the balls back to you. They, they let me uh, start that game, and here it is. It's against the Dodgers, mm -hmm. Tommy Lasorda, uh, mm -hmm. all the guys I know. I mean, it, it couldn't have been better. It was a rainy, rotten morning, and maybe 15 minutes to game time, the sun came out. It was beautiful. <laughs> it ended up being a perfect day, and uh, I got a little lucky. <laughs> we beat uh, Oral Hershiser. <laughs> you know, I think we won 6-3, something like that. That's I think that was the score. And, uh, you know, it was a it was a great day for Miami to finally have a big league game played there. And we won it. And for me to beat Tommy uh, mm -hmm. and Joe and Sharon sat together. So my wife and his wife were sitting together and she was rooting for me. <laughs> that's awesome. That's pretty cool. That's friendship right there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's awesome. What do you think of the game today? I mean, I know today, 2020 is a little bit different, a weird thing, you know, DH everywhere, runner on second in the 10th inning, you know, 60 game season that just ended yesterday. Um, but the game overall, what, what, when you look at the game today, you've seen the evolution of the game. You were around before the DH, you pitched through the DH, you been DH four, you hit. Now you see, and I'm not talking this about the DH, but just in general, are there are there fundamental changes that you've seen to the athletes or the game itself over the last 40 years that you've been in it? Wow. Uh, that is a great question. I think the players today are as good or better than ever. Now, they don't necessarily play better games and stuff, but the athletes are way, way better conditioned. Uh, in baseball, we're starting to use uh, – uh, video way better, uh, conditioning. We're more advanced now than we were when I played. That's for sure. And if the, if the players aren't better now, then we've done a lousy job coaching. That's the way I look at it. So I, I think the game is terrific. The middle infielders today are like scary good. Mm. You know, there was always stars, but I mean, yeah. it, it, Guys from my era and be way before they could play today, and they'd be stars too, but they'd have to get in a little better condition. Sure. The the only thing that upsets me is our best pitchers aren't pitching a high number of innings. Yeah. Our best pitchers are pitching fewer innings, and that's a lot of that's because of the money. Sure. Uh, and we've so that become relief pitchers real early in their careers. Yeah, you know, great arms. You remember when pitch count became such a big deal? I, I'm trying to remember because, you know, you'd throw 130 pitches or, you know, you'd have guys that, you know, in the eighth inning have thrown 110 pitches and Tommy's coming out not to pull him, but just to, you know, pat him on the back and say, you know, yeah, finish let's it. Go. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like you're at 85. I mean, 
you know, this isn't a knock on Kershaw or a knock on Dave Roberts or anything with the Dodgers, but across baseball, if a guy's in the seventh, eighth inning at 85 pitches, you know he's pretty much not coming in for the next inning. For the most yeah, time. as fans, as a fan, I would love to see the star pitchers pitch complete games. Mm -hmm. As a, on the other side of it, um, some of those relief pitchers getting one inning are more effective than a tired, possibly a tired right. start. So, and money. I mean, if we're going to pay multi-millions a year, we're better off with that guy pitching six innings, probably, yeah. than nine. Sure. Um, we may get more wins out of them, or more, we may win more games. He won't win them. Yeah, I'd rather get six six innings out of Kershaw in late yeah. December than have him be done by late August because he yeah. has 110. It's pitches. it's it is not the pitchers that are making those decisions. Oh yeah, so these guys fight to stay in management. But it's still, as a fan, I mean, I'd love to see Walker Bueller go out and pitch the ninth every every night. You know, I mean, that's you know, getting to see that kind of arm work. Sure. Uh, but you're thinking, how long can we have him do this now? Yeah. I, I can remember throwing 170 pitches in a game. <laughs> uh, 13 innings. 13 in, okay. in Minnesota against wow. that great team. 13 innings tied two to two. And Bobby Valentine, my manager, said, that's it. And I went, like, why? Why now? You know, why this after 13 innings? And he said, you got to come back a day early to pitch against the Indians. Because I want you pitching again in a couple of days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's not like you were putting the torque on the elbow of a 90 yeah, on yeah. our best ball, sure. But, but, I mean, Nolan Nolan told me he threw over 200 in a game. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the players are great. The game has changed the way we run it. That's all. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I've eaten up an hour of your day and I know you got a lot to get on to and I could sit here and talk with you forever. I could have five more pages of notes and questions, but how would you, if you were to write your autobiography, I'm not going to ask you what would you call it because that's putting you on the spot unless you've thought about it, but what would be the, what would be the underlying theme that you think the readers or a movie about Charlie Huff's life, what, what would you hope would be the theme and what do you think <laughs> the theme would be? That would be pretty pretty dull right no there. no no. i'd watch it um, <laughs> excuse me i would say the thing that most important i mean uh, mostly in my life how lucky i've been to have been selected by a particular team and get to meet particular people and 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 take advantage of it you know try to learn but I mean, that's about it. I mean, just uh, that I got lucky with a shot at a career and took advantage of it. And like I say, got to be, I mean, I'm still a 12 year old. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know? and you're, you're a perfect example too, Charlie, from what I know about you. Again, don't know you exceptionally well. We did work together one year. Um, we've stayed in touch ever since. I know a lot of people who know you really, really well, and everybody says the same thing about you. You're genuinely just a really nice person who is full of gratitude. And I saw that in quotes. I think when we signed you to, to be our pitching coach in 2006 with the Flyers, you know, just how blessed and lucky you expressed then and you still do. And I think a lot of your success really is attitude. I think a lot of anybody's success is attitude. And I'm sure you saw a lot of really talented ball players over the years who didn't last very long because just that yeah injuries happen but attitude i think i think the mental injury is worse than any physical injury yeah well if you love I, i've always heard tommy say it, if you love what you do you you'll never work a day in your life and that's the way i feel about it you know that it, uh it is my work but i'm not working at it <laughs> <laughs> there you go that's right i'm enjoying that's, it yeah. yeah yeah well, Charlie, I appreciate you as a man, as a friend. I've, I've watched you with your lovely wife, Sharon, as a father, um, as a coach. Before I wrap up, one of the things that I always ask all my guests, and uh, the name of the podcast is From the Heart, you know, the play on my last name. But the reason I do this is, is I really like to get to the heart of why people do what they do. 
and just, you know, you've expressed it for the last hour about gratitude and just how, how blessed and fortunate you feel. But I'm going to finish our interview with just the same question I ask everybody. Charlie Huff, what's in your heart right now? Wow. Uh, I want to win a World Series. That's what's in my heart right now. <laughs> I want to find, you know, it's 50 something years and my team has not won a World Series you know, while I was there. Um, that's in my heart right now. I keep telling the, the bosses I want them to beat the Yankees and then I can quit. <laughs> nice. Excellent. 